All right, all right, all right. Back for another week of the Huddle and Flow podcast. I'm Steve White here with my dude, Jim Trotter. And, and Jim, this, this playoff picture is not getting clearer in the NFL. It's getting a little bit cloudier as we go down this final home stretch. Well, Steve, it may get cloudy down on the back end of the seedings, but on the top end, I'm not so sure it's cloudy at this point, particularly in the AFC. Right, yeah. The Kansas City Chiefs are staking their claim with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Whew, that was a tough loss. Uh, to Buffalo. Buffalo really is is looking like a legit team. And, and Jim, you know, we look at the playoff picture now. You also have to look at some of the quarterback scenarios, not like Aaron Rodgers, who's out here dominating and, and things like that. But I'm looking at like Philadelphia now, okay? Jalen Hurts beating the Saints, causing a potential ridiculous conundrum, bigger than uh, what we thought coming in. Jalen played phenomenally well uh, for his first NFL start, but I'm, I'm one of these guys, Steve, what I try and do, and you know this after covering the league for so long, is to never be a prisoner of the moment. And so we have seen players who can have one good game, one good month, one good season, and then it turns. I mean, look at Carson Wentz. A few years right. ago, we were talking about him as an MVP candidate. So, you know, I don't want to put too much on it. I do want to say for this one game, he was tremendous playing against the number one ranked defense, the poise that he showed, the calmness that he showed. Um, it was like he had been a starter for a number of years. But but I just want to say to folks, don't don't get ahead of yourselves here. Let the process play out. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the number one defense in the team he played. That's the New Orleans Saints. And just coming up momentarily, we're going to bring on Saints head coach Sean Payton, and we're going to ask him about his quarterback situation with Taysom Hill because, you know, this is the first loss they've had. Jim was somebody who substituted for Drew Brees um, and just kind of the future with a lot of things. We know Sean very well. He's going to be transparent. We're going to hit him on a lot of things. But the fact that we were able to get Sean on to um, at a time like this, and they're preparing for the Kansas City Chiefs next week, <laughs> you that, know, that, very, very gracious of him. <laughs> look, Steve, you and I know this. After that game, I think I texted you and like, Hey, is Sean gonna show up? So <laughs> no, you know, no, I texted be, you. You were yeah. you were the assuring voice. You were the calm voice. I was like, uh, is Sean gonna be good? And you were like, he'll, he'll be good. He'll be good. But yeah, then this no. in the morning, you were like, I haven't heard back. <laughs> I haven't heard back from him yet. No, but I mean, he's he's such a stand up guy, and and um, there you and I both know this. There are other, other coaches in a situation like that where you're favored to win a game over a team that's struggling, and you lose it. And now you got to play arguably the best team in the league um, that they might have said, you know what, guys, I know I said I'd be there, but I need to take a pass and put it off. And for Sean not to do that, I just have so much more already I respect for him, but so much more respect. So props to him, because I think no, I don't think I know our listeners are going to get a lot out of our interview with Sean. Um, He just he always goes deep on it. And as you say, transparent And you ask him a question, you'll get an answer. Although on one of those questions, I did have to tell him, Sean, you didn't answer my question. So, uh, (laughs) but he he came back and answered it. So it's all good. Well, Jim, let's not waste any time because this is spectacular. Just absolutely spectacular. So, folks, here's Saints coach, Sean Payton. All right, Jim, now we are joined by a special guest, Saints head coach, Sean Payton. Sean, thanks so much for joining us here at the Huddle and Flow podcast. I appreciate you guys having me on. No, it's our pleasure, man. I've been looking forward to this one. So one of the bright minds in this game, um, one of the more successful coaches in this game. So let's get after it. That sounds good. All right, so Sean, on this note, you know, since, you know, we are where we are, let's address, the you know, just coming off. Of uh, of Sunday's game, we're sure that's that's definitely not the way you uh, saw this going. But you know, when the way your team played, I mean, what was kind of because the energy early on just didn't quite seem to be there. You guys rallied at some point, but how would you kind of assess the, the game against Philadelphia? Yeah, it certainly wasn't one of our better performances. And you know, we came out um, when 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 you start winning and you win three in a row, six in a row, eight. 10 in a row, nine in a row, you know, it's, it's pretty normal to be the head coach and, and look at each week, like, man, this better not be that game. Uh, and I would say this, uh, I, I think early on 
Offensively, we go three and out. Offensively, offensively, some points, points. We miss a full. A full a, we, we we play our best, play our best football. And and I would give credit to Philadelphia as well. I think they they did play well. And I think the young quarterback Jalen Hurts did play well. And I think their defense came up with some stops. But it took us until the second half where we finally got uh, at least a sense of urgency. And and look, it wasn't enough. And I that's. That's on me, and it's always hard when it's on you because it, it just sits in your gut where there's certain signs maybe during the week. Uh, and, you know, I told him after the game, I, I said, look, you know, we can lose this one game, and it, and it counts as one loss. But if we don't learn from just a handful of the mistakes made in this game, then it'll hurt us in a bigger game, uh, a, one that's, a game that's not even scheduled yet. Sean, what mistakes stood out to you? When you talk about learning from mistakes, you gotta love technology, don't you, Sean? There we go. Is it better? <laughs> oh, much. All right. Cool. Let's pick up where you left off, Sean, where you talked about the guys learning from mistakes. I was wondering which mistakes stood out to you most yesterday that they could learn from. Well, look, we we know going in the significance of the turnover differential. Uh, we throw a screen hot and, ha- and and fast. It gets tipped, intercepted. We fumble later in the second half, and we finish minus two. And uh, it's the one thing in our league that will equalize in any game, and protecting the ball was, was one area. Um, you know, look, points are critical in a game like that. The very first time we have a chance to kick a 40-some yard field goal, we miss it. Uh, they make theirs. Um, defensively, uh, we've been good against the run all year. They rush for 240 yards. Um, the quarterback has over a hundred, the running back has over a hundred pick, pick a pick a runner and, and he had positive yards. So it showed up in all three areas. Uh, it, 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 by, by no stretch of the imagination was a game that, uh, there was anything really positive about it. When you look back at the film, uh, there are too many mistakes, uh, we're having trouble throwing just a simple screen pass right now. So this next week will be a, 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 a good, tough week of the fundamentals. Um, it, it can happen, and you can play and play and win and win, and you're hoping you're making the corrections as you go. But too many things yesterday that, that were troublesome when you watch the film. Sean, what, Sean what are, what's the likelihood we get Drew back this week? That's a great question. Um I don't know. I haven't talked to the docs yet. This would be a goal week for him realistically. And yet I know last week uh, he was still having, still having significant pain. So it's a great question. And, and I don't, I'll talk to Bo and these guys probably within the hour. So, you know, on that, Sean, with Taysom, because win, lose, or draw, Taysom's going to be evaluated, right? That's kind of the outside mm-hmm. conversation. What have you seen in him in the games – that he's played maybe in terms of growth, maybe in terms of long-term viability. What are some of the things that you've just kind of seen knowing him as well as you do? I, I think this, I think he was really impressive last week in the third down numbers. The one start he had against um, Denver was a little bit of an anomaly that you can't look at just by the way we approach the game. Um, so his pocket passing, I think, is is improved and, and, it's, and it's good to see his, his velocity, some of his decisions. I think it still needs to happen quicker. I still think he has to process it quicker. And because of that, you're seeing a little bit more in the sack and hurried quarterback totals, even though he can run. And you see this with some quarterbacks that can move. They tend to hang in the pocket a little longer for a play. And so processing the play and getting the ball out is something that, and that's not unusual, but that's something that that needs to improve. Um Look, I think he's got the leadership makeup, all those qualities. It's it's the it's the reps, it's the it's the snaps, and and so you know the challenge is can they can they match where we're getting ready to be in the season? And that's that's the the six million dollar question. Sean, clear this up. I mean, people create their own narratives on the outside. And when Drew went down and you decided to go to Taysom. There was one narrative that you wanted to see what you really had in Taysom and give him an extended um, period here. There was another narrative that Jameis, you just weren't that high on at this point. He wasn't ready to step in. 
and lead this offense the way you would want. Clear it up for us. What yeah, was your thinking? My thinking was a commitment I had made to, to Taysom in the offseason. Um, it couldn't be any further from the truth, the second narrative. Uh, I and we as an organization love what we've seen from Jameis. And, and that constantly weighs in your mind relative to each game. Um, going into the season, all three of the quarterbacks knew that in the event that there were any injury during a game, Jameis was coming in. Uh, the, Taysom was going to have uh, a large plan in special teams and at tight end, and uh, and then we would go from there. And, and so when that situation arose and Drew was hurt for a longer period of time, I visited with Jameis, I visited with Taysom. Uh, I had basically given Taysom my word in the offseason that, hey, this is long before Jameis even arrived, that he would have that opportunity as the two coming back here. Um, that being said, he's being evaluated each week. Um, man, I've been I've been proud of how that room has handled it, uh, Jameis particularly, because he's 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 a competitor and he wants that opportunity. And 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 listen, I I feel like I said it a week ago, I feel like our next quarterback's in the building. And one of the attractions for Jameis, and I understand it, was there aren't many places in free agency where you can go to a team and have a pretty good bet that that quarterback like Drew is going to be playing in his last year. That, you know, that doesn't exist. You go to a team and then you know, hey, you're going to look for that opportunity to sometime be a starter. He He's going to have that opportunity Uh the minute Drew leaves, and both he and Taysom know that. Sean, Sean. could you slide just a little to your right? Because you're to no, your – yeah, there you go. Perfect. Perfect. We got to have that pretty face on camera. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so to follow it up, Sean, um, to say that Jameis is, is developing in a, in a certain way. Look, you, you know how to evaluate quarterbacks. Yes. So is he a viable starter? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because here's the thing. There's no way I would say, like, I, I believe Taysom is ascending, getting better at, at this position. And I believe there's a certain skill set. They're different players. But I believe our, our future quarterback sits here. And and Jameis definitely is a starter. He's, uh, he's, he's performed exceptionally well, considering the amount of time we've had or haven't had since we've signed him. You know, Sean, when a number one quarterback goes down, a lot of teams would tend to struggle. You guys are now eight and one the last two years when Drew has not been in the lineup. What do you attribute that to? Well, look, I think, number one, our depth. We've been blessed and, and smart enough to go find a Teddy Bridgewater, to go find uh, guys like Taysom or Jameis. And it's an important position, um, obviously, just relative to the snaps that they take each game, their hands are on the ball each game. And then I think the other thing is playing a complimentary game. We're playing good defense now, um, understanding what it's going to take to win that game and, and, and just focusing on that alone. The job is just to win and to win and to win. And I think Teddy knew that coming in and was magnificent. I mean, he looked, he got into that first Seattle game, settled in, because that was the first time he'd started in a while coming off his injury, and then began to play and play. And I also think those players that we're discussing, uh, Teddy and Taysom and Jameis, all have, all have unique and special leadership skill sets that easily tra transcend the, to the team. And they're well-respected. Um, it's a room that gets along. There's no... They go their own ways. I mean, there there is a ton of respect amongst each other there, and I and I think that matters a lot. So, but generally speaking, I would say hopefully it starts with having a good surrounding cast, a good team, a good defense, and then trying to take the stuff that we feel like they do well. That that was what I found interesting when Teddy went in last year in that first start. I remember after you won the game and you were up at your preference, and you seemed almost somber or disappointed. And you said in yourself, I was, you, yeah, that you had not given him the best chance to be successful. 
Can no. you explain that to people, what, what was going on there? Yeah, the, the first half of that game, um, man, we got down in, in our first couple possessions. We used timeouts. The formations were probably – we, we just began doing certain things maybe like we would normally do instead of really paying attention to this is the first time this guy's starting in well over two and a half years. And, and how do we calm it down? How do we uh, make it more user friendly? And I was frustrated because in those fir- the first quarter, particularly, I think we used two of our three timeouts Um and it, it was it was me being wordy, me being too long. And then if I can remember, and I believe I'm right, we had a two-minute drill. He finds a screen pass to Kamara for a touchdown right before the half, and that was a big play. And then the second half, he was, he was off and running. And then the next week, he was off and running. And it, it's just, it's just um, you know, you're getting someone up there on the karaoke floor and, and you want to give them maybe early on a song they know by heart and one they're comfortable in singing and not some crazy uh, throwback uh, or new wave song that they've never heard. And I, I think we as coaches can complicate things sometimes. Oh, Sean, you open the door. You open the door. So what is your what is your easy karaoke song? Man, I don't know if I have I don't know if I, it's probably going to be some old Sinatra song. And the only reason I know the words is my dad made me listen to it like 24 seven. And it was like, ah, <laughs> so that would be <laughs> that or Nat King Cole. <laughs> no, I got the New York, New, New York, New York is the go-to go-to like ABCs of karaoke songs, right? You can go up there and most, you get me and I'd be able to hit the notes, but that's like the lyrics that you can my get. My dad there. would play these, especially <laughs> during Christmas. He, we would Man, we'd have the old albums out, and we would be listening to either three artists. And then he would tell me why he ranked these artists where he did. But it would be Mathis, Sinatra, and Nat King Cole. And, and he would go through, like, we would constantly, he'd get me arguing, and I didn't know any any of them, just to, but he, he loved that, that discussion. But Sean, Sean, and I love Frank, particularly during the Capitol years, but was Frank's voice really smoother than, say, Dean Martin's? No, I, Dean was smooth. Smooth with it. I got you with Dean, but he would go on about – he would give you Johnny Mathis every time. My father would, like, you know, in relative to voice talent. And, uh, yeah, I think Frank, from a commercial standpoint, relative to the movies, and there, there was an element, obviously, a talent level, but – it's kind of like when you hear them argue about guitar players sometimes that you don't, you really are like everyone in the industry knows like this person is the one, you know? And I think that's the case with when, when you talk about voices like those guys. Are any of those three on your current Christmas playlist? I made the players. I made the players a few years ago. Gosh, I'm trying to think. I made them listen to Nat King Cole and read the history uh, and, have you ever seen that where he does that Christmas song with his daughter and they go back and forth? Right. And him and Natalie. It, it, yeah. They put that together. I made them listen to that once. I try to give them a little a history of, of every once in a while, something will come up. Um, yeah. That's important. We had uh, right here in New Orleans. I mean, it wasn't too long ago. Um, oh, we went through the, the passing uh, fats domino and, and many, there's so many uh, of, of these younger players didn't realize the impact he had on music. And, and he was living right across the way here in, in West Bank. You know, what's interesting, Sean, is that um, we had DeMario on recently. And his I believe the direct quote was, Sean is about the culture. So for victories, you will bring in the light machine, the smoke machine, the music will be going. That's you put indeed. together... Yeah, so so how much do these guys keep you young and how much do you really get into the music that, that you choose for them to listen to after games? Listen, I, I think it's the greatest thing. One of the great things about my job as a coach is being um, able to be in this environment where you're kept young by your players and you're kept up to date. And, and uh, but 
but then you have a chance also to kind of go back and, and help them like as they're listening to, for instance, the latest rap, I'll remind them when I was in college, you know, they were inventing rap. And, <laughs> and, and so before you were even born, <laughs> I had the lyrics <laughs> to the DMC or the, or the Beastie Boys or the Grand Ma I mean, th and so I love being around that, that environment and that youth and enthusiasm and it keeps you young. It does. I mean, you're, uh, um, you know, there's an old saying you play and you play and you play, and then they tell you, you can't play anymore. Then you ask, well, what else can I do to stay around? And then for me, it was coach. Well, Sean, you know, to that point, you know, and you've seen Jim and I down at your, you know, covering you and the Saints for sure. you know, probably more than 10 years now. And your locker room vibe has maintained a sense of maturity and accountability, but also just like currency, just like being current, being fun. You know, the, the roster has changed, right? But but how do yeah. you maintain that culture as to where you can have a locker room a couple of years ago, you know, with, with the late Will Smith and, and, and Roman Harper and some of these guys, and it's kind of the same now, you know, even though Teron Armstead there, but you got new players in there. How do you maintain that? Yeah, I think it's, it's a daily – process we we talk about it it's a daily process we have to we have to give attention to it we have to give water to it sunlight to it we have to pay attention to it like a garden and we have to pay attention to it when we're bringing in players from the draft from free agency they like we we talk all the time how will our locker room how will they fit in our locker room that's a responsibility that that i feel we have to that locker room of bringing in like-minded competitive football players that enjoy the process are passionate about playing football. Um, and that's not easy. That uh, that's something that if, if for a minute you take for granted, it can slip. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's paramount to winning and it's paramount to winning over a long period of time. You know, Sean, I've asked players this in terms of what are the most important qualities or traits in a successful head coach, in a head coach being successful. And I wonder from you, I'd like to hear from your standpoint as a coach, what are those three pillars, let's say, that you believe are most critical for a head coach to be successful in the National Football League? Well, number one, I think there has to be a, a knowledge base that's um, – Yet you have to know and be an expert uh, in the game. I, I think that um, because ultimately you, you can't fake that and you're going to need to be able to correct things in, in any three phase and you're, you're going to need to know, uh, you're, you're going to need to be a, an expert relative to the game of football. You, you need to be number two, an expert teacher. So you can know it and yet have trouble communicating or teaching it. And then that's not going to bode well. So I think you're, I think in, in, in deep down in our soul, we're teachers, right? I mean, we're, um, you know, Wednesday night, we stay here late work on third down and then they come in Thursday and we teach third down and we've got to be able to present it, teach it in a way where they can remember it. Uh, and part of teaching is motivating and captivating and all those things that uh, a great teacher in any subject matter has those skill sets. And then I think, uh, I think the third one is you got to be real to yourself. And, and, uh, and I, I think when I mean by real to yourself, smart enough to yesterday, you know, it was difficult, but man, it, that game bothered me because I felt like, man, my hands were, real dirty in it like in other words i didn't do a good enough job and it's okay uh it's okay to say that and then turn around and, and put together another good week but i think you got to be real to yourself and to your players and i think i see from a from afar the mistakes made with younger coaches trying to be someone different i had a great opportunity to work for some really talented people you know john gruden I, and then i coached under uh, parcells and yet I still couldn't be Bill and I couldn't be John. Um, but, but teach, teach, 
you have to be an expert at the craft and then you've got to be someone that can communicate and, and be uh, uh, and be real that way. I think that's important. I, th I think that's such a great point about being authentic. And I just wonder how long did it take for you to, to get to that point? Because when a coach gets an opportunity for the first time, a lot of times they will try and do things like the person that they worked under. Um, and you yeah. worked under some pretty strong personalities. How yeah. long did it take for you to, to, to say, I'm okay being Sean Payton? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I Here's the thing. The reality of it is, and, and it's just today's game. Man, seven or eight coaches this offseason will be new. They'll arrive at their dysfunctional organizations, right? They'll, wherever they go, they, they will have gone to a team that has been losing or have not had success, and for one reason or another. And then all of a sudden, every one of them, you take that timer and you just set it at three years. And you've got to have some good fortune. You've got to have, I mean, Six out of the eight of you are going to get eaten by the sharks, and maybe two of you are going to get to an iceberg. And, and that's a fact. And so I can only look back on that experience post-Katrina. We got here after the 05 season. They had won three games, and I thought our team that year was going to win three more. I mean, I we struggled in the preseason. But we had a good training camp. Um, we had good leadership. And – we won 10 games in 06 and rested starters and had the two seed. That's, that's unusual. Um, and so what you're trying to figure out relative to how you're going to be to your team and, and, and you got to be careful. You don't spend too much time trying to figure it out because it has to happen like now. And they have to know now and they have to know you care about them and they have to know you're consistent and they have to know that you're going to play the best players. And so often you see clubs, they're going to play the draft pick ahead of the free agent, even though the, the rookie free agent maybe had a better training camp. The minute all that stuff starts taking place, you're going down that, that road of dysfunction that I always talk about that exists in our league. And there are more of those teams than functional. That's just the truth. And history shows us that. Just keep, keep paying attention. There's 10 or 12 teams that can win the Super Bowl and the other 20 can win on Sunday, but 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 they can't. And now that's not etched in stone. That shifts. That changes, in other words. And, and so back to you have to have some good fortune. Who else is helping you along the way? Do you have an experienced general manager? Do you have an owner that's vested in truly trying to bring in the right type of people? Uh, are the scout in the scouting department and pro personnel on the same page relative to who we're looking for. We just ID'd the makeup and the traits we're looking for, but are we really all in on that? You know, and so um, that all happens with that three-year ticker going, and it's a it's a race. It's a um, it's a challenge. Sean, go ahead, go ahead, Jim. No, well, what I was curious about, Sean, is you. I have had these conversations with you and Steve has had these conversations with you about the lack of diversity among head coaches in the NFL. Absolutely. And, and I'm curious as to what you feel based on what you have seen and witnessed in your time in this league. Um, why is, why does it remain an issue and what can be done to sort of level this playing field if you or or the opportunities that are presented to people? Well, people. it's a it's a, it's a great question. It's a topic that's disturbing for a number of reasons. It's an ownership topic, number one. It's a general manager topic, number two. And so often in our league, you because the money is good, those in positions of power want to increase their longevity. That becomes their number one objective is stay employed longer and longer and longer. And so what does that mean? Well, 
Do I, am I comfortable working with this person? Am I comfortable working with that person? Um, you know, typically a general manager can survive two coaches possibly before it's, but you're not seeing that as much anymore. And so my challenge always is this, and, and I use an example all the time. I work with David Shaw in Philadelphia. I think he's a bright, extremely bright coach and, and Stanford graduate. He coaches at his alma mater. Every time I bring his name up, everyone says, well, David, David's staying in college. And I said, understand that. But, you know, Steve Spurrier was staying in college and Nick Saban was staying in college. And there have been a number of college coaches staying in college. And at some point, someone says, no, you're coming here because we're going to make you take this job with this amount of money. You follow me? Matt Rule was staying in college, had two teams. And so why is it that a young, talented coach, Stanford graduate, West Coast offense, offensive guy, and and – I always begin with David because I know him and I know how talented he is. Now he may, he may turn down all of those opportunities, but you know what? He didn't have those opportunities where someone said we have to have him because someone said we have to have Nick or Steve or one of these other college coaches or Matt and uh, don't get me started. But it is. No, I want to get you started. Yeah, it is. <laughs> rev it up. It's it rev is, it up. It is an ownership and general manager issue, and and quite honestly, I think there there are some that are just threatened or uncomfortable or don't feel like they know. I've I've had one owner tell me, "Well, it wasn't a strong list this past year," and I call BS. I call BS, you know, and, and he said it in a meeting and I, I just looked and shook my head. And so um, where are you looking? Um, are you looking to win? And man, I, I just, uh, I get frustrated because I understand the copycat nature of our league and looking for, maybe you'd say, Hey, I want someone that can help develop quarterbacks. I understand that. And yet are we willing to, are we willing to move past a Belichick or, or a Dungy? Like, in other words, uh, more mistakes are made and they're spent on winning that day. And so just fast forward here to this offseason, cue in any one of these new jobs, cue in the press conference, and then I'm going to hear at some point we got our guy. Oh, yeah. It's the same thing that happens during the draft. You know, it's, it's, it's we got our guy. And I always think, well, we'll see in three years. Don't worry about winning that day. Worry about winning two years, three years removed from that day, uh, like they're doing in Miami right now. Like they're doing I, – I just get frustrated relative to ultimately the people end up – the people that are actually – making the decisions. And that's why, listen, I, I say that it, uh, we work in a great league. And yet when you're at a functional place, there's never been a better time to win because you're at a, a distinct advantage. Back to the question at hand, how do we improve this? Well, we've taken steps. I think the hiring cycle right now is awful. I think the idea that we're going to hire an interview during the postseason is ludicrous. I think Monday when the, when the Super Bowl is finished, Monday after that Super Bowl, the process should begin. And at that time, you can begin to discuss and talk with future head coaching candidates. I don't care that it doesn't match the college schedule. That doesn't bother me. But the idea that we are going to begin interviewing during the postseason candidates, all right, for prospective jobs, and then ownership and the GM are going to feel like, well, we're, getting, we're going to be left out. You know what? More mistakes are made in a hurry than 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 with patience. All right. I know that. And so the hiring cycle should be no different than the free agency cycle. Monday, we can begin negotiations. The hiring of a new head coach can be Wednesday after the Super Bowl. And then the following Wednesday, you can begin talking to assistant coaches. Therefore, you're not losing losing out on the assistance that any of these teams might want to hire. And the same goes for scouting. And no, do we know that there'll be backdoor discussions? Yes. Yes. The same thing that exists right now in free agency with agents at the combine. All right. But 
But the idea that we need to get the ball rolling is flawed. And I think the be enemies of the world that are having success and going, I think that the idea that that process is going to begin. All right. I saw it happen to John Fox. I saw it happen to Marvin Lewis in the Super Bowl in 2000. They're going to be one of those two is going to be the next head coach. All right. Of the Cleveland Browns. And. And all week long, the discussion was, man, Marvin and John, Marvin and John, and both were the defensive coordinators in that Super Bowl. And the game ended, and by, like, dinner time, word got out that Butch Davis or someone else had gotten the job. And there's this panic that sets in. And I would say I would say that group of, of people, ownership, are, are probably some of the um, – least qualified to 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 make those decisions and so you've got these search firms then and then you've got i've got every day i get a a text or a call from someone who would you recommend who and they're about you know ultimately you got to trust somebody and if you don't know then you got to trust somebody that you're you're that's working with you but i do think we we start with a flawed system when we begin interviewing after the first round of the play- or second round of the playoffs, when we've got time, we push the off season back. Where are we going in a hurry right here? Why aren't we waiting until after the Super Bowl? It, and, and it benefits the teams that are winning. Also, they don't, they don't want guys that are torn between a game plan. And I don't care if it's a buy, say what you want, man. The minute someone says, we're wanting to talk to you about being a head coach I don't care where you're at. I've been there. Your mind is like, huh? Okay. It, and it's just because cause, cause my mind 24-7, and I think all these coaches that are putting plans together, man, you get engulfed in a game plan. It's nonstop. That's all you're thinking about. And I just think that we've got time in the schedule to do that. You'll hear a lot of people give you reasons why we can't or shouldn't, but we should. We should, and hopefully we can get that ironed out. We can figure out the the small details, but pushing the clock back, number one, I think can help. Uh, You know, I'm close friends with John Wooten. John Wooten hired me into this league. (laughs) I was at Maryland, and Maryland said when they called, uh, Coach Gruden and Callahan were giving me an opportunity to go to Philly, and and, uh, Maryland said, well, we're not going to let them go, and Wooten said, well, we're not actually going to ask. We're going to take them. And, uh, and John and I had these discussions uh, at length. You know, it used to be there was an opportunity maybe at ownership, uh, the owners' meetings. I, I think that's uh, I think that's viable because there has to be a comfort level, and and it can't be just word of mouth. And how do we how do we how do we get to know owners better as assistant coaches? I think that's a challenge. Um, you know there. The Bill Walsh program began when training camps were six weeks long and you could get a young, hot college coach to do that training camp and still make his, but the calendars don't allow that anymore. I I think uh, that program really etched up another level is kind of what we've tried to set here where we're not just going to have an an intern for training camp. You know, we're going to spend a lot of time on, on quality control coaches that are with us for the whole year that are on payroll, playoff checks, Michael Will Hoyt, Doug Williams Jr., um, those people uh, that are full-time. And because, look, make no mistake about it, we're in the business of grooming coaches like we are players and quarterbacks. You know, I want to know who's replacing Dennis. And I want to know who who are next uh, because they got a chance here in two or three years to make an impression and Mr. B used to say to me all the time, coach, they're, they're, they're wanting to interview our coaches. And I used to say, Mr. B, man, you, sh- you should get nervous if no one wants to talk to any of our coaches. <laughs> right. That's when you need to get worried. <laughs> Sean, I'm curious, if I can real quick, you made a comment there that, that you said to an owner that this is a weak class or a weak year, and you called BS on it. Yeah. I'm wondering, how do they define what a weak class or a weak year is? Because it seems like many of them don't even know what they're looking for in a head coach to begin with. So did you press them at all on what exactly do you mean by that? Well, I, I, 
I just politely waited for him to finish and then expressed my opinion in that I didn't think that was the case, that I could think of many strong candidates that hadn't even been brought up. Um, but that's just a lack of knowledge. That's just someone who uh, is going to rely. Can you imagine relying on a on a, a headhunting search firm to tell you that information? Where are they getting their information? Exactly. Thank they're you. Getting, they're getting it from these random text messages that I, that I, so um, man, you dig and you find and you research. And, and if you're not willing to do that, then you go ahead and continue to lose. Sean, Jim, Jim and I, several times on this podcast, we, we've, we said, we're going to save these owners from, from paying search firms. And we, we've given what we call the, the green book, so to speak of potential co coaching candidates and general manager candidates. And that's where I want to change gears because, you know, you talked about general managers and earlier, you know, at the beginning of the season, you all promoted Terry Fontenot, uh, an African-American. Mm -hmm. He's been in your personnel department to assistant general manager. He, he's right there with Jeff Ireland. Um, and Kai and, and you, yeah, right. Exactly. And, and Kai. So these are two, these are two African-American personnel guys who seem to be on the track to get some general manager interviews. Um, why was that important to you? Cause you have talked about this for years, but instead of just talking about it, it seemed like you and the organization decided to take action. Say, look, here's guys who can do it. Here's their resumes. And we're putting them in front of you by giving them these titles. And they're not just titles for titles sake. Yeah. I think honestly, we've just gone through a year where, you may deep down, and this is, I'm, I'm going to speak man, in, in your, the soul of your belly feel like there, man, there is not one thing where I feel like I look at one man's color of skin and, and, and treat it differently. And you do your own self check during 2020, right? Cause there's a lot going on in our country with the president, with, uh, with race relations and social injustice. And it, it and so periodically, then you, you'll you'll say, "Man, is there anything I'm missing on this?" And and I think Mickey does a good job of looking at that, like, "Hey," um, and he and I spoke, and I'm like, "Those guys are doing great jobs for us." And 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 so it was Jeff, who was white. It was Kai, and and it was Terry, who who both are African American, and it, it was they were they were deserving, but. When you go through a year like this year, and man, I love, when I say I love this team, I love the makeup of this team relative to Malcolm and relative to DeMario and relative to our, it's the best thing about what we do is not only do you get to be young, but you get to be around people of, of such, uh, of such diversity. And, but you go through this, man, look, let me check my own closet to make sure that there's not something I'm doing that's offending someone some way, shape or form. You, you, you know, you, you, you don't think that's the case. And yet our jobs, I think as, as, as clubs and organizations is to really, man, you might think, Oh, we're doing fine. And then, but if you really shine the light on it, are we really doing as good a job as we should be? And are we missing something? And, uh, and I think if we're not, looking at things that way, then, then we're not being proactive enough. I give you credit for that because it's so important. And um, I think for you, Steve has made this reference before about you sort of being um, the Greg Popovich of the NFL, if you will, that you're unafraid of addressing these issues. And Sean, I'm wondering when you do address it and you bring it up to folk, what typically is, and I mean people of power, people in decision-making positions, what typically is sort of the reaction that you get when you basically call them out? Yeah, this is a, stuff, a tough state to do it in. And just like Texas is probably tough for pop. Um, and I've, I've had my moments with gun control and gun violence. It just drives me like uh, nuts. And so it's fine by these folks as long as I'm winning. Hmm. You with me? How about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, how about that? Mm -hmm. well, I'm winning. It's okay. Speak on it. <laughs> yeah. But, Speak but, you on know, it. Truth. 
But but Sean, on that note, I mean, you you have you've spoken out on gun violence. Um, and I've you kept have, <laughs> but, yeah, <laughs> you kept winning. But I mean, this summer, I mean, the, <laughs> the, yeah, there's a little pressure to keep the winning on right down there where you are. But this summer, after the Ahmad Arbery and George Floyd, said, the tweet you put out with pictures of both of them were killed, were murdered, not killed on video. How many have we not seen? Mm. So besides all of the repercussions that you potentially talk about, as long as you keep winning, what do you think? Because you and Brian Flores are about the only ones who are proactive saying ownership be damned, reaction be damned. What do you think that means to the players and the people who you are really around in the NFL to say, I'm not waiting to, for people to tell me what's right and wrong or what sponsors think but I'm going to go ahead and put myself out there. What do you think that did to galvanize them to say our, our coach is about it. Sean Payton is about it. This is a guy I want to go play for or be around when the opportunity arises. Yeah, I think, look, I think maybe um, for some players, that's really important for others. You know, when, when you go through this acquisition of talent, you know, there are times where it's just about the money and the contract. And there are times uh, sometimes regionally a guy feels like, man, I'm, I'm home. And someone else might feel like I'm, I'm as far from home as I've ever been. Um, and then uh, there are other times where there's just a fit, a personality fit. And um, the details after the game, the locker room, the $30,000 sound system, the smoke, the, um, entertainment possibly I mean, everything in the meetings it's all an example of strict attention to detail and well so that doesn't just stop with the the motivational i mean it, it, it's the attention to detail and i'm not i'm not going to be and i'm fortunate enough and, and blessed enough to to be coached here long enough to where I'm not worried about the the Quiznos sandwich deal or the Burger King sponsorship deal. If it doesn't come across the right way, I, I really don't give a flip, you know, tough. And so that's kind of how I feel when I saw how Will Smith died. And I knew I had a belief all along in a certain thing about these guns and the idea that they're going to be the, the, and and I know that our founding fathers weren't envisioning the, 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 where we're at today. And, and we get caught up with, with that amendment and watch and watch and watch and don't make any changes. It's, it just amazes me. And so I really don't give a flip how you feel, honestly. You know, I don't give a flip if you don't agree with me. This, this is what it is. You know, buck you. You know, Sean, you can you can have that attitude, as you say, because you're winning. Um, and when you look at the numbers, um, you've coached the, the the most the highest number of games in, in Saints history. You have the highest win total. You have the highest win percentage. Um, we look at your offense, for instance, top 10 seven times in 14 seasons, um, three times at number one or I'm sorry, six times in total yards. Um, you were in the top 10, six at number one, 11 overall, I should say, scoring seven times in the top 10, three at number one. Um, I'm wondering, what does it mean to you to know that, one, you're the second longest tenured head coach with one franchise behind only Bill Belichick with the Patriots? And what would it mean to you to be able to say possibly coach for only one franchise your entire career. Is that something you think about? Is that important to you? Um, I don't think about it. Uh, I think about just functional opportunity. And, and the great thing is Mrs. Benson affords us that she, she's been amazing. The transition from her late husband, Mr. B, who was great. Um, and now the way she, uh, the way she leads as an owner, uh, I've been with Mickey for those 15 years. Um, I think 
we're, we're fortunate enough to not get caught in some of the dysfunctional minutia that we were discussing earlier relative to drafting or signing or you name it, hiring. And we always start with, you know, what's the right thing and will this help us win? And, and, and I don't take that for granted because I think that's the minority, not the majority in our league. Do you, we talk about even with players, Hall of Fame. Do you think about that? Um, only, only once a year when that time comes and you see the ceremonies and you see the different people involved and, and but it's more about, it's, it's really more, I mean, I think the number one thing every one of us seeks, seeks is man, that, that, um, that respect amongst our peers, like that true, like respect in the industry that this guy's something else. And, and then the rest of that other stuff, you, you know, is, is, I think that's what we seek. I mean, if we're, I mean, I consider myself passionate about football and passionate about teaching and passionate about hopefully winning. And, and so, uh, That, that comes up occasionally only during that time of the year where you're seeing these others that you're just like, man, can you imagine his, his career ended like that? But it, it's really driven more about the respect of your peers. Well, one of the things we know with head coaches of late is that those with multiple Super Bowls victories have a better chance of getting in to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So from that standpoint, I, I would ask you, what would a second Super Bowl mean to you? Um, a second would, the problem with the second is, is right afterwards, you'd want the third and, and that's just part of the deal. Um, and that's okay. Yeah. That's not okay. like Pat Riley. I mean, yeah, why not? Yeah, that's okay. Um, we're, man, we're, we're, we're doing everything to, to get there and, one of the, thing, the things I said the other night is you, you're going to find in our game now, man, it's not a best of seven. It's not a best of. And, 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 the, and the challenge is you, 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 you just can't have an off night. You know, now the good news is you don't, there's only three, three games, maybe four games, but you just can't have one of those like bad halves. And uh, there's a, there's such a finality with it. Um, but no, that's what we're looking to do. But Sean, you, you didn't answer me. What would a second one mean to you? One would mean a lot. It would. Hey, listen. It would be. <laughs> it would be fulfilling. It would be fantastic. Uh, there's nothing like it. You know, before the first one, I'll never forget. You know, I was approached. Hey, we were in the playoffs. It. Uh, this guy wants to do a book with you. Blah blah blah. But only if you win the Super Bowl. And so when you are in, like, right where we're at right now, and you bring up like possibilities like, Hey, I'd want you a weekly guest on, on me and Steve's podcast. I'm like, sure. You win the soup. Yes, indeed. Like you, man. And then, and then all of a sudden it's the day or two after you got confetti still in your shirt. And then you're getting a call like, Hey, you remember you told us now. <laughs> <laughs> you told us. And then, so uh, it would mean a lot. It would mean a lot. Um, but it honestly, you ever watch a movie or go to a restaurant several times, but you're with someone who's never seen that movie or gone to that restaurant and you're with them for the first time. And in other words, right. yeah. In other words, you've seen it. They haven't. You've right. eaten there. They haven't. And you're like, wait till you see, come over here. Wait till you see this. Now take a look at the menu. You need to order at, or watch this scene. This is, that's the part. And that's the, the thing you look forward to most. And I'll say to these guys, whatever your vision of it, of that week or two prior to that game, it's 10,000 times stronger. Like I can't. And so it's more about, Malcolm, uh, Drew, and Morstead, and maybe one other. Wait till the rest of these guys see this. You, you know what I mean? Wait till they experience this. You know, a few years ago, 
we had that tough game here against the Rams, and I was so disappointed for uh, Mike Westoff. You know, mm-hmm. here's our special teams coach, 75, 76 years old. He's accomplished everything you could accomplish as a special teams coach. If there were a Hall of Fame, if there was a spot and more space, he'd be one of the first special teams coaches in. And I was so disappointed that he wasn't going to get a chance to experience a Super Bowl that he had never been to. Mm. Wow. Wow. Sean, how how important do Go ahead, how, how, real quick on that point, to some degree, in terms of getting to a Super Bowl, how important is it now to have a number one seed, knowing there's only one, you know, in terms of the buy, you only get one buy? Um, I think, look, I can make an argument the one seed gives you rest, right? But, man, the early seeds this year come with a tariff. It's like winning the lottery, but you, you only get – because home or away, it's crickets, no crowd going. Yeah. So the, the the teams, the the visiting teams, record this year's ticked up in our league just because of the crowd noise. And so, you know, we're trying to figure out a way here if we got the you know a home playoff game, how to how to find seventy two thousand COVID free, been been away from everyone for a whole week, you know, with the freaking. You know, the whole nine years, kid, 18 years old, they've gone through, they've been quarantined in a hotel. <laughs> We're already thinking that. That's Project Game Ball. We're working on that right now. Truth. <laughs> Sean, you can do like California out here and shut everything down. And right, I know if you, you know, know, if you told gonna... Saints fans, if you told Saints fans, we're going to shut down the city for two weeks so that we can get 72,000 of you in that stadium. I have a feeling they would be okay with it. Right. And, and, but let's, you would start with like guys like Fauci, like, all right, I know it's possible. Tell us how. Like, in other <laughs> words, like when I say the cleanest 72,000 where there's no way they've been, they've been, they've been on jury duty. They've been at the hotel. Um, anyway, <laughs> but that's the difference this year with the early seeds. The early seed, the, the one gets the rest. But outside of that, I mean, I don't think anyone's afraid of traveling to play because it's it's quiet. Absolutely. Sean, okay, so as we as you get ready to button this up, I mean, your respect for, like, great leaders, uh, sports-wise or other, who, who are some of the people? I mean, you just mentioned something like an Anthony Fauci or whatever, but who are some of the people you, you've looked at over the past year or historically whatever? You're like, man – these are people I pattern myself after, or these are people who everyone should kind of look at as beacons to do things the right way. Yeah. My high school coach was one of those, was one of those people. What's the coach's he, name? J.R. Bishop. And he's, he's still alive. He was one of those people though. He was, you know, there's an old saying, uh, gosh, he had in front of his book. It said, be fair. It is much easier to be fair than trying to appear to be fair. Mm. And I think that exists in a lot of things that we're talking about today on this show relative to hiring, relative. It's much easier to be fair than to appear trying to be fair, you know. And so um, but he he was a a huge influence for me. Uh, There's been so many of the guys that I've worked with. The late Randy Walker was a big influence on on my career. Of course, uh, John and Bill. Um, and then I would say, um, it, it, not just in, in, in the, in my parents, not just in the coaching world, but just people in leadership positions. Um, you know, I, I think I watched the show on, on the vice presidency the other night and they were, the show was based on the relationships that presidents and their vice presidents had. And it it was fascinating to see how that's changed over time. But um, yeah, I, I think it's easy to spot sometimes and, um, and you're drawn to whoever these people are. Um, I think that the commissioner currently in the NBA is someone that I, that I see is like, wow, leadership. Why do you say that? Adam, Adam Silver. Yeah. Yeah, I feel he's feel like there's a part of him. It's not because of any policy when he's when he speaks. Number one, you you feel a, an active listener. 
And then number two, you feel someone who's one of, who's one of the smartest in the room, you know, but you, uh, there's a calming demeanor about him that, um, that I think is, is positive. And there's a, uh, an element about him that I think transcends, uh, everyone he works for. Mm. Awesome. You know, before we finish up real quick here, Sean, there's one thing I wanted to do with you and ask you, you've got a handful of other coaches who have won Super Bowls in this league, active coaches right now. And I just wonder if you could take one trait from each of them, what it would be. You mind going down that list? Yeah. And I know him by heart here. All right. So I'm with Tomlin Swagger. He's got a little bit of, you know, puts that, the, the maverick top gun sunglasses on <laughs> with me yes all right um belichick's uh man you name it um just uh his his overall i mean he's 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 the guy so there, there's so much just from a from a football perspective teaching you're always feeling like when you play one of his teams or see him from afar that they're doing two two other things that you haven't heard about yet. <laughs> they're they're learning how to return a kickoff. Two different, you know, you just feel behind. Um, Andy Reid's got a a great demeanor. I think his players love him, and so that's a trait that I think they follow him wherever. Um, and and I think. Uh, that's a trait that served him well. Um, Pete Carroll, I don't know what he's taken, but his energy level and, you know, the whole, I mean, he's just, listen, I hope when I'm his age, I don't know his age, but I hope I have that same energy, but it's pretty impressive when you watch his enthusiasm, you know, and, and it's the same with Russell. If you ever heard Pete and Russell after a tough loss, it's like, oh my gosh, like that, you know, Stop. these guys, are, they've already turned this thing around and you feel like after the, after they've talked, you're like, wait a minute, did they win or lose that game? They just played <laughs> right they that way. And, it, and it's a talent and it's a credit to them. Um, let's see. Um, of course, Mike in Dallas now, who's going through a, obviously a big, a big challenge there and a turnaround there and, and uh, having won a Super Bowl and, and trying to help rebuild, um, you know, he, he was always kind of that, he was part of that, um, that Bill Walsh and Mike Holmgren. And, you know, that, that was a pretty good tree to be from it. it you know, a lot of coaches came from there. Um, I'll give you another coach that, that no one's talked about that. I think could, could coach in our league and win another super, or win a super bowl. All right. It's Lovey Smith. Mm. I would have Lovey as a GM, real high on my list. Now, is it because I know him? Well, yeah, I know him, but I've gone against him. I've seen his teams a couple plays away from the Super Bowl in Chicago. Uh, It was Lovey's defenses that started taking the ball away on a crazy mad level like the whole league is doing now when he was back in St. Louis. And he's at Illinois now. But but there's another example of of a coach – um, that you could draw many parallels to that would resurface possibly uh, if he were white as opposed to African-American. And so he would be like, one, like if I all of a sudden had a team, like that would be one of my top candidates that I'd want to bring in myself. Wow. And, wow. Uh, Interesting. And you just now you just have to do a little digging and research and, and do a little studying. And, you know, the last place in the NFL he was at, Tampa Bay, all right, he, he had begun that process. They actually lost a game against us on purpose. So they stayed in the one spot. No one ever talked about that. The last game of Lovey's – the last game the Saints played Tampa Bay, they pulled their starters at halftime so they could draft Jameis Winston. No one – they asked Lovey to do that. And in the following year, he gets fired. Um, crazy. Wow. Ownership, ask him to pull the starter. Listen, I'm just telling you. I'm, I'm just telling you. 
they had a lead. They're beating us at halftime. And all of a sudden, all their starters are out of the game. It was the last game of the season. That went away quietly. No one said a word about it. I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? And we'll, we'll take this win. But, uh, yeah, I'll never forget that. I forget the year. It was the, it was the last game of the season, and they – they basically had the first pick of the draft. Well, Sean, and, I'm gonna give you three more coaches real quick. You just gotta I give me trades. Coaches that are in our league that have won a Super Bowl. Yes, sir. All right. So, um, you just played one of them. Oh, Doug Peterson. <laughs> I'm still mad at Doug. <laughs> You're mad. I don't think I'm nice to say about Doug. <laughs> Your golfing buddy. <laughs> He's the best. He's a great guy. And man, um, you know, what he did when you win when you win the first Super Bowl for a city like he did for Philly. And I lived in Philly. I grew up in Philly as a kid all the way into seventh grade, but um it's pretty impressive considering the run they got on. Um he doesn't have a bad day. I, I would say that's a great trade of his. He's got a smile. I think he's uh, I think he endears himself to his players. Um, so there's two others that I haven't hit on. Who are they? Gruden and Harbaugh. All right. Both of them. Yeah. John, I know well, um, and, and both Johns, we were all together. John Harbaugh. You ready? John Harbaugh, John Gruden, David Shaw, Sean Payton. We were all on the Philadelphia Eagles staff at one point under Ray Rhodes. Mm. And, and I'm not even talking about Emmett Thomas. I'm not talking about uh, Juan. I'm not talking about Bill Callahan. Uh, you know, in other words, it was a really, really, really talented staff. And uh, we kind of, we were tucked in the back. Um, John came after my first year. Uh, I think, listen, I think John's a tire, tire, tireless worker. And again, one of those guys you follow, uh, I, I think he's, he's got, he comes from a great coaching family. And I think he's one of those guys that stands for all the right things. And Gruden is is on a planet, like just a different planet with the with with how he works. He taught me how to work, and uh, um, and is doing a, a real good job in, in Oakland. But his, I'm talking about two Johns. John Gruden is one of those guys that you just feel like is he's he's going to be wee hours uh, grinding on a plan and you know you're gonna you're gonna get something intellectually that's difficult and challenging. John Harbaugh, you, you know you're getting one of the better coach teams every year and, and it, his his numbers will tell you that. Um, I mean Sean, that, that, that staff um one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight but that's yeah. that staff that's a Hall of Fame staff, man. Whoever put it together is the person all of these owners should be going to now okay. right? as they're searching for a head coach. But, but, Sean, was that staff better than the Packers staff you were on? I don't know. They had a nice picture. On, they, no, they had a nice picture on the stairwell. That It's kind of become – I think – look, I do think as a head coach, man, I want to see – Dennis Allen get another chance. And I want to see uh, our guys, Dan Campbell here. And I want to see Aaron Glenn. I want to see, I'm just naming a few, Ryan Nielsen, Pete Carmichael. You know, I want to see Darren Rizzi. I want, I want to see these guys have opportunities. I, I um, Curtis Johnson was hired by Tulane. Dennis Allen became a head coach. Doug Marone. Uh, those guys were all part of our early years here. And, uh, I, I want to see them, you know, have those opportunities uh, more than anything. All right, well, Sean, this this has been spectacular, Jim. We okay, so we so Sean and Jim, we've touched on like Dean Martin, Nat King Cole, Fats Domino, Johnny um, Mathis. You're leaving Johnny, out. Man. My dad Mathis, is I, I can't, you can't talk about <laughs> Dean Martin before Johnny Mathis. That's true. <laughs> That's true. My my mom actually went to high school with him, or Johnny they were Mathis. in the same. Yeah, they were both go. in San Francisco, so I shouldn't wow. say they went. I don't. I don't think they were at the same high school, but they all knew of each other. Yep. There you so. go. So we've talked great coaching staffs, great, great musical. You know, just just some of the greatest singers. And, and Sean, you know, 
your your transparency that you you've shown to Jim and I over the years and today. We can't thank you enough. The league is better with you. Uh, we really appreciate it, and uh, good luck next week. I think uh, you got you got a pretty good game plan. You got to dial up. We do. Like, and you guys, like, can you imagine? It's Kansas City Chief Week. And Trotter and White say, hey, we need you for like all of an hour while you can be like figuring out a way to defend this freaking number 10. And so when he's no. running through our defense next week. No, Sean, you, got, you, you know got this. You've got your scapegoat. No, no. But, but you know the discussion was after that game last night, is Sean going to show up tomorrow morning? Is he, is he going to make the show? You guys know there's nothing parties like a winner. And, and in the industry you're in, there's nothing worse than uh, the next day after someone's had a tough loss. And yeah. um, absolutely, I'm showing up. Uh, it, honestly, the, the hardest thing, we, we live so week to week with our success of winning and losing, it's, and we get out of balance. And because you start getting really filled when you win uh, in a in – a, in a, um, in an unhealthy way. And then when you don't win, like it's despair in an unhealthy way. And you guys have been really good therapy this morning. Honest to gosh. Well, Steve, we promised the listeners that they would enjoy uh, this interview with Sean Payton and that they would learn, learn a lot. And I think we um, held up our end of the bargain on that. I think Sean is just tremendous. You know, he's got a great football mind. More than that, though, I just I respect the fact that he's willing to address some issues that others might shy away from, at least publicly. And, you know, he's right when he says as long as he's winning, he's got a lot of leeway to say things that others might not say. And it's sad that that's the case in our society now. But it is what it is. And, and I just respect Sean Payton for addressing these issues. Well, Jim, history is history is written by the victors. And, and so mm-hmm. like I said, as long as you're winning, you can have those types of things. I, I just thought it so fascinating how he said that their quarterback for the future is on their roster. So either, you know, Jameis Winston or Taysom Hill. Um, we'll just see if somebody wants to come pluck Jameis Winston in free agency, but it doesn't sound like the Saints are going to allow that to happen. Um, and just some of the other things he said about leadership and the fact he called BS on an owner saying, mm-hmm. that, hey, there's no diverse candidates. That means Sean recognized that this owner is just listening to Joe Donut over here telling him that, there's no diverse candidates. So, you know, the respect for Sean um, and what they're doing is just is just the success and, and just him as a human being just just through the roof, Jim. We know him well. We know, you know, some coaches like him. It seems like Brian Flores is kind of developing into that lane, so to speak, in a lot of different ways. But just the leadership qualities that he shows and that he, he elicits and respects, you know, I, I just love hearing him talk about it. Yeah, you know, there are others. I, I don't in any way mean to single out Sean and, and even Brian. You know, you've got um, Kyle Shanahan who has spoken on these issues. You've got Pete Carroll who has, who has spoken Carroll, on yeah. these issues. So there are others who are out there who are doing it. Yes, and I think the more that we hear these voices, hopefully the owners start to listen because the reality is there are many qualified candidates out there um, of all races to lead these teams. And, and no one is asking um, to be given anything, you know, these men have earned the opportunity and all they're asking for is an opportunity to do the thing that they have prepared themselves to do. And Jimmy, as you button things up, we saw over the weekend and last week, the NFL um, announced its team nominee for the Walter Payton mm-hmm. man of the year award. And as we know, the Walter Payton man of the year is the award that players, regardless of MVPs and rushing champions, that is the award they hold with the utmost prestige because it's on and off the field. Uh, you know, we had Demario Davis on from the saints. Um, he is their nominee. I think he's got to be a leading contender to win it all um, for everything that he's done. I mean, I'd be, I'd almost be stunned um, if he didn't win it all, but Jim, just your thoughts, you know, you're, you're a pro football hall of fame voter, you know, this league well, but just when you see some of the things that these young men do, yeah, you know, Steve, one of the reasons I came to NFL network was because I wanted an opportunity to highlight the work that these men do and to show fans that that there's a three-dimensional being there, you know, that there's more besides just the player. And so um, whenever I see this list, uh, I study it just to see exactly what are some of the different things being done 
by all of these men. And they're not alone. There are others on their teams who are doing things as well. But I just think it's a credit to these guys, um, you know, for the crowd that, that wants them to just shut up and play. Um, I'm happy that they're not. I'm happy that many of these players have found their voices this year to, to be willing to speak out on some of the issues that we see in our society. So for me, this definitely is one of the one of the highlights. And, you know, and it, as you say, it does mean a lot to these players. When I walk into some of their homes and you walk into their office, that that award, I've seen it on their desks in their offices. So it's in Kurt Warner's to- every shot he does on our network. Absolutely. So for 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 anyone who thinks is, that this isn't important to these players, I can tell you from firsthand experience, it's very important to them. And, and here's just a small example of the character of these guys. I want to highlight this. Andrew Whitworth, the offensive tackle for the Rams, who's out with a knee injury right now. Last week in Los Angeles, late in the week, the owner of a soul food restaurant called The Serving Spoon. It is one of the most famous gathering spots for people of all races in Inglewood, California. They said that the COVID pandemic has basically bottomed them out. And if they did not raise $75,000 in like a week, they were done. This is going to be a COVID-related shutdown of of a communal institution. Andrew Whitworth and the Rams called them up and said, how much have you raised so far? They said, we were at about $25,000. In about four seconds, Andrew Whitworth cut a check for the 50 grand. And now they're well exceeding that. Here's Andrew Whitworth from Louisiana, right? He's only been out in, in Southern California for a couple of years. And he understood the importance of this restaurant to people, again, of all races in this community to go to one of the most popular soul food places in California. It may seem whatever, but to people like me who go there and people who, who gather and see, you know, Trevor Reza and Ludacris and, so many of these people in the community go there just to eat and enjoy themselves and talk and play chess, whatever. Something like that, man. These guys, Jim, like you said, we can't talk about the little things and the big things they do enough. No, and so many of them do it without anyone ever knowing. Um, but I, I think it speaks to as much as we're in this climate where there's so much negativity and so much focus on the negative, there are so many positive things being done. And, and the power of the human spirit, I think people – in general are, are are caring and are giving and want to see their neighbors do well. And um, props to Andrew Whitworth, the Rams, and all of these players who are out there um, trying to make society better. Absolutely. <clears throat> all right, Jim. That was a banger. Sean Payton brought the smoke. You brought the smoke once again. Our producer, Thomas Warren, doing his thing on the ones and twos behind mm-hmm. the scenes. So, look, we thank you all for listening. And again, subscribe to the podcast. Leave us your thoughts on it. That way, we can give you more of what you're funking for. All right. And now for the Howard Mob, Jim Trotter, Thomas Warren, I'm Steve White. We are out. Ooh.